Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Live, Learn, Lead luncheon series. I'm Jan Paul, and I'm Executive Director of Leadership Sandy Springs, and we're so glad you joined us today for this important conversation about policing in Sandy Springs. For those of you who are new to Leadership Sandy Springs, we are a nonprofit, and we are dedicated to uh, empowering and um, inspiring leaders to become transformational change agents in our community. And we do this by developing, educating, and connecting our leaders through innovative programming, through community engagement, and through volunteer opportunities. If you're interested in Leadership Sandy Springs and would like more information, please visit our website, leadershipsandysprings.org, or you can email me at jan at Leadership Sandy Springs. Okay, so for today's conversation, policing in Sandy Springs. We have all seen images around the country of social unrest that have stemmed from uh, excessive police force. Today, we're here to talk about policing in Sandy Springs. We are gonna talk about what we're doing right, what we can improve on, and what we can look forward to in the future. And we encourage you to join into the conversation by asking questions in the chat room, and we'll get answers for you from our panelists. So let's jump right into it. I'd like to introduce our panelists and our moderator for today. <clears throat> First, we have Mayor Rusty Paul. He was elected mayor in November of 2013 and brings over 40 years experience in federal, state, and local municipality public and elected office experience. He is currently serving in his second term as mayor and he was elected to the founding city council in 2006 or 2005 rather for one term. Earlier in his career, Rusty served in the first Bush administration under Secretary Jack Kemp at Housing and Urban Development, and he was Assistant Se Secretary for Congressional and Intergovernmental Relations. Rusty is also a former state senator. He served on the Stone Mountain City, uh, City Council, and he has served on the boards for the Atlanta Regional Commission and the Georgia Municipal Association. Next, we have Deputy Chief Keith Zagonsk, who joined the Sandy Springs Police Department in May of 2006 as a part of the initial command staff. He was appointed deputy chief in 2016. Keith graduated from the University of Georgia in 1991 and began his law enforcement career in Smyrna. And Keith is a proud graduate of Leadership Sandy Springs, the class of 2017. Keith is married and has two adult children. I'd also like you to meet our moderator, Dr. Clarissa Sparks. She is a branding and marketing professional with over 15 years experience in developing integrated marketing experiences. She currently serves as CEO for Sparks & Company, an educational branding agency that teaches business leaders how to market their brand. Clarissa is also a host of Brand Focus Live Business Radio. It's a podcast where entrepreneurs share who they are, what they do, and why it matters. I'm proud to say that Clarissa is also a member of Leadership Sandy Springs, class of 2019. She also is co-chairs our communications committee and is a member of our social justice committee. And one final thing I'd like to say is that I would like to thank our sponsors today for making this possible for us to bring our, our webinars to you. We'd like to say thank you to Northside Hospital and to Ross and Pines for sponsoring our program today. So let's get to it, Clarissa. Please start us off. All right, sounds good. Thank you, uh, Jan, for a warm welcome. And to our panelists, I'm excited to start this conversation for our community. And we're just gonna jump right into it. Uh, the coverage uh, for police brutality over the last year, it has been in the mass media, it's all over, it's the topic of conversation. And we want to know here, how will we reinsure us here in Sandy Springs that you're gonna keep our community safe? And we'll start with uh, uh, Mayor Paul. Okay, uh, you, know, you know, with all the, all the issues that we've seen on television uh, and, and even here in our own state uh, with uh, Mr. Arbery down in, in Brunswick and in other instances, it's obviously a top of mind issue. Uh, and, and Mr. Floyd in, in Minneapolis, uh, anybody who saw those videos uh, had to be moved by what they saw and uh, to some degree uh, horrified. Uh, and, and I get asked all the time, what's the likelihood of 
that sort of thing happening in Sandy Springs? Could we have civil unrest? Could we have a situation like that? And the, the, the truth is, is if it can happen in any community, it can happen in our community. We're in a lot of ways no different as far as, you know, our population and so on. But what we do do, and I know Keith will go into this a lot, is the, the best way to to try and prevent those things from happening is making sure, first of all, you have good quality people in your police department. We hire only the best and we've been in for, we've been fortunate from the very beginning. We've been able to hire uh, the, the top quality people available in law enforcement. And that's still going on, even though we have uh, it's, it's very difficult to uh, find people who want to serve in, in law enforcement today. Uh, Jan and I have a nephew who just left the city of Atlanta police department because he just felt there was, you know, it's, 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 he doesn't have the support of the community, didn't have the support of his leadership. And he decided I can do other things with my life. And it's, it's being a police officer is a very, very tough environment. And when you can't get the best to fill positions, sometimes you end up hiring people who have, you know, have issues. We have been able to avoid that in Sandy Springs. So it's always about, getting the best quality people that we can can get to serve as law enforcement first responders. Secondly is training. Uh, we do a lot of uh, work on training. And again, Keith can give you a lot more detail about it. But one of the great things is, is we spend an awful lot of time training our officers how to de-escalate situations, how to handle tense situations. When, when a police officer shows up, people are normally not uh, it, it, at their best behavior. Right. Uh, they're under emotional strain or stress, whether you've been pulled over for going too fast or there's some other incident uh, in, in your life. And so police officers uh, have to respond uh, reactively and the way that you get the right reaction is making sure they're trained to be able to handle almost any situation. And then we continue to rely on technology. You may have seen uh, on Tuesday night, council voted. And, and I, I have to say this, this came from the police department, didn't come from the policymakers. This came from our police leadership where we're buying uh, uh, body cameras for our police officers, all of them. We've already had uh, body cameras for most of the people who are in their cars. We're expanding that to people who may also have in some other capacity have interaction with the public. And uh, it, the, uh, the new tasers that we're getting are, are, are better quality technology. And when that taser is, uh, is removed from its holster, it automatic, whether the, the officers are trained to turn their body cameras on the second they leave their car. When they turn on their blue lights, as Keith will tell you, uh, the, their, their dash cams come on. So we're recording and they're trained to do that. But if for some reason there's a stressful situation, somebody gets out of a car, forgets to hit that body camera, when, they, when that taser is removed from its holster, it will automatically activate the body camera so that we, we are monitoring everything that goes on in every, every instance. So those are the kind of things that, that we, we do. You, you, you look at your training, you look at the quality of your people, uh, and, and you try to focus on making sure that that they have the technology, the training, uh, and the ability to de-escalate when you have tense situations and they use proper technique. Uh, and then uh, you, you have to fall back on that. But, but the truth is, you know, we've got great people, but they're human and they can make mistakes. And, and there's, there's nothing that could prevent that we can guarantee that a, a, an incident like uh, uh, I think we could guarantee that a George Floyd incident wouldn't happen, but uh, I, I think that there, there could be situations that arise where uh, mistakes are made and then it, that creates problems. Uh, but we do everything we can from a training and technology point of view to make sure that, it, that we minimize the uh, risk for that sort of thing. So Deputy Chief, can you speak to the training aspects and tell what you're doing as a department to make sure that your officers are trained to um, de-escalate or minimize being a headline to reassure us? Well, um, and everything that the mayor said is, is, is 100% correct. Uh, you know, it can happen anywhere. Uh, who knew where Ferguson, Missouri was before that incident took place. But uh, with, with the training that we do for our officers, we, we take a lot of pride in, in not only the training, but the equipment 
and and starting with the personnel that we hired as the as the mayor mentioned and uh it's we we do a very rigorous background check for all of our officers uh more so than most departments do uh for example we had a, a individual that applied for a job from new jersey we sent an officer to new jersey to newark which is dangerous in and of itself but we sent an officer up to newark to interview neighbors, look at the police department and interview the file, look at the file and, and do a very thorough background check before we ever let anyone in the door here. And then with regards to training, we have a very, uh, we have a very rigorous training program, both for our new officers, new recruits and the officers that come to work here. And uh, de-escalation, use of force, the law surrounding when you can use force and when you can't, the proper uses of force are all things that we train on throughout the year, every year. Uh, it's, it's not just a one-time thing where we, we teach officers in the academy some, some law and then forget about it. We teach it every year, every year. And we, uh, we even have a goal this year and, and for the coming years to make sure that we use de-escalation training, bias-based training, uh, bias recognition training, in every aspect of in-service training that we do, whether it's dealing with use of force or not, it may be a, a driver's training class. We're still going to talk about it in all of those training sessions so that we really, really send it home to all the officers. Can you go into a little bit more detail about the de-escalation training and maybe as it applies to mental health, uh, a cause for mental health challenges? So dealing with, with mental health issues is, is, is a big challenge. And that's probably one of the biggest focal points that, that we have in this country right now is trying to figure out what are some of the best ways to deal with these situations. Now, most of the time when we get called to a situation that, that involves someone that's uh, having a mental health crisis, the family has already done everything that they know to do. We're a last, we're, we're the last resort. And we're typically, as the mayor referenced, we're typically coming in in a situation where perhaps things got too violent for the family and they just don't know how to control the situation um, or they just don't know where else to turn. And so, you know, equipping everyone with a taser device, making sure that we have less than lethal or non lethal tools on our, on our belt and available to us to use, you know, should we need to restrain someone are very important. Those are in addition to teaching our officers how to recognize, you know, when someone's in a mental health crisis, things that they can say and do actions that they can take to calm the situation down. Um, you know, we have several officers that are trained in crisis negotiations uh, as, a, as a great example, we just we had a young lady just a couple of weeks ago threatening suicide. She was she was on the bridge of uh, Northridge over 400, threatening to jump into traffic. And we were fortunate to have a couple of officers there that are very well trained and were able to calm her and, and talk her down off off the bridge and, and ultimately save her life. That's good. Um, Clarissa, yeah. let me let me interject one thing. I want I want to say something about about our police department. How that you brought up mental health. Um, Jan indicated that that I worked at HUD uh, for four years, and one of my responsibilities was managing homeless programs. I spent uh, one night a month in a different homeless shelter, uh, so I could understand how things were operating. Because I all I did was sign a lot of paper and give grants away, and I wanted to understand how these things work at the street level. Uh, uh, we've had a significant in, uh, in, uh, flux of homeless people coming out of Atlanta because they're telling our officers that, you know, we, we know most of the homeless people in Sandy Springs. There's a couple, of, there's several of them I know first name basis. Right. Uh, we talk to each other uh, and, and I, we, I check to make sure they're, they're fine and everything's going okay. Uh, but we've had a large number of homeless people coming up out of Atlanta because they're, uh, they're saying it's just not safe to be on the streets of Atlanta anymore. And so they're, they're moving North. Uh, and our police department noticed that and they sat down and, 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 and talked to them and uh, understood what the problems were, what was going on. 
we don't arrest homeless people unless it's necessary because they're breaking the law or doing something like that. Our officers are trained to make sure that homeless people get the social services. I mean, the people you see on the street generally are people who have either drug dependency, alcohol dependency, or they have mental health issues. Uh, the people that are homeless because of economic circumstances, you very rarely see them because they're embarrassed and they don't want to be seen. They're hiding in our community. Mm -hmm. But the obvious ones are the ones that you see walking the streets. And generally, that's that's a re result of, of uh, dependency or mental health issues. Our police, I, I, I was at uh, was going to Whole Foods about a month or so ago, and a couple of our bicycle officers were standing in the parking lot talking to a guy who was uh, homeless, obviously one of our new ones. They kept their distance. They kept their hands out where they could be seen. And they just talked calmly to the guy uh, and uh, got him calmed down. And, and he was very fine. And, and as soon as things turned to normal, they got on their bicycles and, and, and rode away. Uh, so I was able to watch how they de-escalate and how they work with people who may have mental health issues. And they did a phenomenal job, in, at least in that instance. Uh, and there were a number of people who stopped and watched. Uh, that's the thing about our police officers today. They know, they know that they're under observation at all times. And that's a good thing yes. because that helps make sure that there's discipline there, that the discipline and training are maintained. But uh, this, this was a program that, again, came from our police department and our chief, from, from uh, Ken DeSimone and, and, and Keith and, and the team. They were the ones who put this homeless uh, uh, proposal together, came up with how to, how to work with these new people who were coming into our community under duress uh, and brought it uh, to city management and have done a great job of implementing it. So there's a lot of compassion in our police department when, when they're dealing with people like this, they understand what is putting people out on the street. They know that a lot of people live on the street by choice. They don't want to go into institutions. They don't want to be confined. They're afraid to go into homeless shelters because of the danger that may be there. And I've seen them on two or three occasions do a phenomenal job in working with these people and making sure they're safe and taken care of. And when it gets cold at night where they're under threat, they, they get in their cars and go find them and, and make sure that they're sheltered. Now, just as a support service, have we considered maybe having social workers on staff or in um, partnership to help with the homelessness or uh, or even with de-escalation? Keith, I know I know that's an area you guys have have uh, been working on. Uh, you, thanks for the thanks for the softball, Clarissa. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're looking at a lot of. Uh, different uh, test pilot or pilot projects that are going on around the country right now with regards to having uh, either social workers or some sort of, of, of trained professional going out alongside with police or, or responding just themselves to some of these calls. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't initiated anything yet at our police department. We're, we're looking at how things are going to, to play out and work out. Um, you know, one of the things that we've always done here at our police department is we've always had uh, employed a, uh, a victim advocate that works out of our uh, criminal uh, investigative division. And, you know, she works a lot with, with the victims, families, uh, uh, not, and it's not always victims. Sometimes it can be families of, of people that are either have been arrested or are suspects in crimes and really tries to uh, she, she's, she comes more from the clinical standpoint of, uh, of addressing issues with folks and tries to, to help people through the process when it comes to the criminal justice system, especially. And the work that, uh, that Keith and, and the team are doing on having social workers, this again is something they came to the city with, say, we'd like to explore this. We, we think this is important in today's environment. And so they got the green light several weeks ago to, to pursue that as, a, as an option. So they're working on pulling it together now. Um, uh, going back into the homelessness, do we have any shelters here in the area that we can redirect them to or how is that ha um, handled? Keith, you may want to talk about how you, you know, the social services uh, access that you guys uh, try to get to. So I, I don't, I don't know if there, if anybody's on the call today, but uh, certainly 
the uh, CAC up here on the, the north end of the city is a great resource for us. Uh, we also have a few other uh, groups. As far as a, a physical shelter in the city, we do not have one, uh, but we do have access to shelters in Atlanta and uh, in Marietta as well. So we, we, we know where we can, if, if someone needs a shelter, uh, we have access, uh, access to those if we need to take someone or, or help somebody get to one. Okay, that's great. I want to kind of go back to the uh, systematic biases and some of the headlines that we've seen. Do you, how do you feel that the other elected officials have responded to um, incidents as a um, Ahmaud Arbery or Breonna Taylor? And how would you have responded differently? Well, I think we did respond. Uh, when we had uh, an outpouring of emotion and passion and concern from uh, the Floyd incident, the Arbery incident, the uh, shooting at the Wendy's in downtown Atlanta, uh, we had protests. Uh, and uh, I attended several of those protests. I felt the same level of passion that, that they had. And uh, it was interesting. One of our schools uh, had, a, had a protest outside of uh, City Hall. And I went down and talked to the kids. And they were from one of our local schools and chatted with them and, and, and thanked them for their passion and for the, their caring. And uh, down the street, there was one of our officers uh, sitting in his car. And they had some signs that weren't necessarily flattering to the police department. Right. Uh, and I walked down to the officer and I said, Hey buddy, what are you up to? He said, I'm making, sh I'm here making sure that, uh, a group of our citizens first amendment rights to address government for grievances is protected. And I, I laughed and I said, you're doing, you're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, that was the attitude of our, our police department. And, and, uh, I think, I think our officers were, were, uh, felt the same sort of, horror from some of the things that they, they've seen. I mean, they're people too. They, they understand the pressures that police officers are under uh, today, but they understand the right way of doing it and the wrong way of doing it. Uh, and, and so w I think all of our, our council members have responded to it. One of the things we did officially was the civic dinners uh, initiative that uh, right after that happened, I asked staff, I said, we need to have a conversation. You can't fix problems uh, you can't address problems unless you're willing to talk about them and talk about them in, in, in reality what, what, and, and understand what people's attitudes and opinions are. Um, and so we had the civic dinners. We had over 300 people participate. We worked real hard to making sure that they were, uh, that the total number of people who were involved were a cross section of the community. And we, got, we wanted people to feel safe, that they could state their opinions uh, uh, without any, uh, you know, fear. Uh, and we tried to create that environment. There was some conversation, well, why aren't the city officials on there? Well, the reason city officials aren't on there is it's not us talking to people like I'm doing right now. It's ta them talking to us. And when we're on a conversation like that, it changes the dynamic. They end up talking, you know, wanting to hear from us rather than us hearing from them. So we, we made a conscious effort not to have some, have the elected officials on so that uh, we didn't we didn't change the nature of the intended conversation. Yeah. Uh, so, and I think it was very successful. We're going to uh, continue those conversations. One, one series of, of meetings is not gonna solve the problem. This is an ongoing issue. It's gonna take continued effort, continued focus. We're gonna continue this. We're gonna look at other forms. I will be asking the uh, council to approve a commission after the first of the year to look, to, to look at the issue of not diversity, because we are a very diverse community. We don't have to go out and build diversity. What we have to focus on is inclusion. And one of the things that came out of that dinner was the fact that a lot of people didn't feel that they were included in, uh, in the community, uh, that they, uh, they, weren't, they didn't feel that they were welcome or accepted or, or an integral uh, part of Sandy Springs. And we have to change that. Uh, and that's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take time. Uh, it's going to take some changing of attitudes, but it's also going to have to involve some very difficult conversations. Uh, I'll be honest. I thought that when, when Barack Obama was elected president and it was one of the, he wasn't my candidate, but I was in a TV studio uh, with uh, Bernice King and Dr. Joe Lowry. 
and they were there when President Obama, when it was announced that President Obama had won the election. And I was proud as an American, as a kid who grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, during the civil rights era, I thought, okay, we finally overcome uh, the American original sin of, of racism that, that sprung from, from slavery. And that was a naive perspective on my part. Uh, I, I, I've learned over the last year or so uh, that while we've made a lot of progress in my lifetime, there's still a long way to go. And we have to be able to con- talk to each other, share information with each other, let people know how we really feel so that we understand how other people in our community are uh, reacting and feel. And then with that conversation, uh, hopefully some changes and, and uh, new ideas will come of it that we can build that sense of inclusivity that we are obligated to try and attain. Right. And I think that's um, going into one of those tough conversations and that often comes up is good cop versus bad cop. And I know that and during these times, you know, it's a it's hard to be a police officer. I can only imagine. Um, Deputy Chief, can you speak to that? How do you handle misconduct within the Sandy Springs the Police Department? Or how do you make the residents feel trusted within the community? Well, uh, one of the things that we do, and I think one of the things that is, is most important for not only a police department to do, but for local government to do, is to be responsive to its citizens. Mm -hmm. Be open. Uh, One of the things that I think that we do very well here in Sandy Springs, uh, both at the police department and at City Hall is, is as a citizen, if you reach out to your elected official, you reach out to the mayor's office, you reach out to City Hall, you call the police department, you'll get a response. We will, if we will call you back, we will answer the phone, we will talk to you. And we will listen to your concerns. And we are, we are very open to that. When it comes to misconduct, we entertain complaints from anywhere, from anyone in, in any arena. So if you were pulled over on a traffic stop and you're not comfortable, you, you, you don't trust the police, um, but you wanna, you wanna let us know of something that happened and you send, a, send an email, we will investigate it. Uh, if you call us and leave us an anonymous tip on the phone and don't want to leave your name, that's fine too. We'll investigate it and look at it. And we're, we're very proud of the fact that we, we hold all of our people accountable. Mm-hmm. And if, if there's a complaint, it'll be looked into. Now, it may be sustained, it may not be sustained, but I can assure the public that we look into every complaint of misconduct and we take everything seriously. Uh, sometimes we can, if, if there is a sustained misconduct by an officer, sometimes we can fix it by training um, or, or taking some other sort of disciplinary action. Uh, we, we certainly look to fix problems as opposed to just letting them continue on. Now we've addressed a lot of the good things that the officers are doing here. What are some things that as, as the deputy chief, you know that we should improve on? Well, I, I think we can always do a better job in, in exploring how we can leverage technology uh, to, to improve our jobs and improve how we do our jobs. And, and we, one of the things I'm particularly proud of here in Sandy Springs is that we have, we have great support. We have great support from the community, but we have great support from City Hall. And so, you know, for example, as the mayor mentioned earlier, when we go to city hall, when we go to the mayor and council to look to expand our technological advances, you know, the, the body cameras, we wanted more body cameras for folks, better taser platform. Uh, you know, as long as we go to them with something that's reasonable and it's going to make us help us do our job better, uh, it, it typically gets approved mm-hmm. and, and we get support in that fashion. And that's, it's greatly appreciated and certainly helps us do our job better. Yeah, and that's very important too. Leading into, we're talking about the civic dinners and having the conversation. And speaking of conversation, I know in a lot of um, households, particularly um, minorities, they have to have what we call the talk. And that's how 
um, they, how their children should respond um, if they are pulled over by an officer. And what would you say to a, a, a driver or someone, a resident of color, if they're pulled over? How, what, how should they respond? So you know, advice to parents. <laughs> advice to parents. Uh, so my advice to parents would be if, if, you're, if your child is going to be pulled over by a police officer, they find themselves in that position of being pulled over by a police officer. They should respond to the police officer the same way that you would want your child to respond to a teacher or a, a school administrator, uh, you know, stopping them in the hallway of their school. Be respectful. Uh, you know, I'm not asking that you respect me, but just be calm, respectful. And, you know, if, if you're asked for your driver's license, produce your driver's license. If you don't have a driver's license, you, you know, we engage in conversation on the side of the road all the time with folks. And, and it's, it's all about communication and conversation. And it's, something that we, you know, we, we just want folks to understand that we're doing a job. So for whatever we pulled you over for, it may be a, it could be a lane violation. Maybe you were speeding, maybe you ran through a stop sign, whatever the case may be. We're approaching someone that, that we don't know. So we're, we're not going to get out and, and be typically overly friendly, but it, it is, it's, it's a job. And we're, we're going to typically uh, approach it from a business, business-like standpoint. We just ask that the, the drivers don't overreact, don't worry, uh, just be respectful and answer the questions that you may be asked the best that you can and feel free to ask us questions. What, um, for us, uh, the, our community makeup, how are you, how can you instill trust within the minority communities um, with their interaction with the police? Well, uh, that's a great question. They're all great questions. Uh, we make an effort to get out into the community. And we, one, one of the things that we do here at the police department is we, we have a lot of community outreach programs that we try to include as many people in as possible. Mm -hmm. And we, we train our officers, uh, we talked about de-escalation already, but we train our officers on, on communication skills, how to approach folks and, and how to deal with people. But we also want people to see us as people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, 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 we're people inside this, in, inside this uniform, we're, we're human beings just like everyone else. And so I, I think including more folks with community programs and, and getting out there and just having casual conversation with folks is, is something uh, that, that's, that's, that we try to do more of. And we don't, you know, one of the things that, that's happened this, uh, this summer is that a lot of the uh, focus has been put on what police are doing, what, what are you doing? What can you do to, to, to make things better? And it can be a two way street. We would love to have more folks come up and just have conversation with us. And uh, one of the things that we see here in Sandy Springs is we, we do see a lot of that. We'll have people come up when our officers are out having lunch or uh, especially the bike officers out around city Springs. Uh, people feel, I think much more comfortable now coming up and speaking to them and uh, just having casual conversations. Larissa, also one of the things, and, and, and Keith didn't touch on this, but I think it's a, a, a tremendous tool that the police department has developed over the years, is our police academy, mm -hmm. uh, where citizens come in for uh, several, uh, one night for several weeks, and they go through uh, with our police officers and they teach them about different aspects of policing. And part of it is how we deal with homeless people, how we deal with mental health issues, how we deal with these situations and so on. And they go through a, what is it, Keith, about a nine week course, 10, ten weeks, 10 weeks. Yeah, ten and I get, I get invited up to, uh, to speak to them. And then a lot of people will continue on. We have other levels too, that you've seen the, the, 
the cops cars, citizens on patrol. These are people who've gone through that process and decided that they, they want to be part of the police department. And we've asked the police department to expand those programs so that we can bring more of our just ordinary citizens in. And one of the things I've been impressed by is the uh, diversity within these classes. Uh, oftentimes we have a large number of Hispanic and African-American, Asian uh, uh, residents who are participating in this. And it's a great way for ordinary people who have concerns about policing, particularly, to come in and understand and build relationships. I've never talked to a single person who'd gone through that who didn't come out with a tremendous amount of understanding about what policing really is about and, and, and how our people react in different situations and what their roles and jobs are. And so particularly people of, uh, of color who may have concerns about the police department, I would strongly encourage them to go through these programs. I know not everybody's got one night a week that they can go and we're looking at some weekend uh, programs. We've asked the police department to, to look at some flexibility to get other people in. It's a great way to build that rapport, to build that understanding. Uh, and, and most of the problems come when there's a lack of understanding, either on, on both sides, of, from the police department or from the citizens. And these kind of programs that Keith and his team and, and Chief Simone have been building over the last several years are a great way for the community to get a better understanding and then to provide feedback to our police department. It's a great way they, they, they meet with all, from the detectives to the street, to the senior guys, all, and they, they get to see a, a look at the entire department, see how it works together and uh, an ideal way to, to get a better relationship between the police department and the community. That's a great segue into representation really matters. Um, Deputy Chief, what is the makeup of the police for, for as far as uh, African-Americans represented or Hispanics and other uh, race cultures? So we have... Uh, we're, we're fairly representative of, of the community that we serve. So, uh, you know, the, the majority of the makeup of the police department is, is Caucasian. Uh, we, we have a significant number of females. Uh, we have females in leadership roles, which we're proud of. Um, the, the percentages, I, I don't have exact percentages that I can give you of everything, but we do have uh, representation, uh, good representation from both uh, black, Hispanic, uh, and and Asian officers here on, on the force here in Sandy Springs, and we make it we make a, a concerted effort in our recruitment efforts and uh, when we when we're reviewing applications to to make sure and highlight those things. And you have several officers who are very fluent in Spanish. Many of them of Hispanic uh, heritage themselves. So, uh, and it's something, you know, we're not as good as we want to be, but uh, it, it's an ongoing issue that we, we know that we need to address and, and the leadership is working hard to address it. Okay. So for those underrepresented um, ethnic groups, how are you recruiting? How do you recruit a good officer? So that's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, one of the things that we're fortunate with here in Sandy Springs is that we are one of the uh, not only better respected police departments in Metro Atlanta uh, and the state for that matter, but we're also one of the higher paid police departments in, in the state. So we don't have too much of a challenge from that standpoint. Uh, the challenge is getting the right people to put in to want to be police officers. Um, you know, getting people to come in and want to do this job for the right reasons. And that's why we do such a, uh, a rigorous background check for, for people that are trying to come on to our police department. And uh, right now, as, as, as we mentioned earlier in, in this uh, webinar, uh, it's hard to get, we, we get plenty of applications. It's the quality applications that we're looking for. We're looking for the best people and we're not, we're not going to settle for anything less. I don't know that Keith would address this, but I think there's an important point that needs to be made here. Uh, and to, to illustrate how difficult it is to, to be a police officer and why recruiting is such a challenge. Mm -hmm. I've had officers tell me my wife, you know, we allow our officers to take their cars home at night uh, because it, you know, being in the community and if they, particularly if they live here in Sandy Springs, that, 
kind of is a force multiplier. We've had we've had families tell their officer spouse, "Don't bring your car home in here anymore. I don't want to be a target. I don't I'm, I don't want people thinking that a police officer lives here." I've had police officers tell me, "My wife told me last night to go in and turn my resignation in. She's." tired of worrying about me. She's tired of getting this, all this pushback about being a police officer. And, and she said, I, you just go in and, 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 and quit. Uh, so it's not just the community that, uh, you know, where, where they face challenges. It's at home. Right. It's this, this sense and the perception of police officers that, you, that these incidences that we've talked about on television, where we look at the rogues in policing and we, we extrapolate that to the entire police force has a, has a huge impact on our ability to get good quality people. Uh, I've, as I said, I've, I've had a brother-in-law, a nephew, and an uncle, all were police officers. Uh, they loved their job. Uh, they loved being out, being a police officer and helping people. Uh, but today they, they wouldn't, as I say, the last member of my family just left the police uh, force in the last three or four months. And that's happening everywhere. And it's happening in our own force, not because they lack support from the leadership in, in the city or they lack uh, support from, from our community. I, I, Keith it indicated that it is, uh, you know, they get more support here than probably just about anywhere else. All you drive around this town, you see signs everywhere. I support Sandy Springs Police Department. But those things are very helpful. But uh, this overall perception that all police officers are rogues and, and, and are, are bad is creating morale issue that is very makes the recruiting environment very, very challenging. And in the minority communities, it's the same way. They say, look, the police are bad. Why do you want to go be a police officer? Sure. You know, uh, why do you want to go join the enemy? Uh, that's a real challenge when it comes time to recruit officers. Uh, so uh, somehow or the other, we've got to change the perception about about who these people are and the importance of this job and the dignity and respect and the and, and the benefits and the psychic rewards of being a police officer. We've got to get back so that we can continue to recruit the best and the brightest uh, of all backgrounds, of all ethnic groups, of all genders to uh, be part of uh, this very, very vital profession that we all depend upon. Well, um, Deputy Chief, what makes a great applicant? Well, um, someone that is well-educated, doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't necessarily mean that they have to have a college degree, but someone that's well-educated, well-rounded, um, someone that, <clears throat> excuse me, someone that has a desire to serve uh, because ultimately that's what that that's what our job is all about uh, I, I hate to use the, the the hashtag of protect and serve but it is it, this is a service industry and it's, it's about serving the public and you have to have uh, that desire to come out here and and uh, sacrifice uh, a, a lot to come out here and serve the public um, you know, we ask our folks to to work on Christmas and work on Thanksgiving and uh, miss soccer games and, and miss uh, miss graduations and things of that nature uh, for the job. So that you so, you know, the right applicant has to have that mindset and understanding that uh, it's it's truly about service. Sure. Now, with all of the uh, headlines and recruiting good officers, Blue Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, have you had to change the protocols within leadership? Or I know we've kind of talked about training, but what about your actual leadership? Well, you know, we have to be, uh, as, as law enforcement leaders, uh, we, we have to be flexible and we have to understand that, uh, we have to be willing to change with times. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, uh, just the, the obvious example that everyone in, in their careers has, have, have experienced is, you know, I mentioned technology earlier. I started in this job in 1991 and things are 10 times different than, than they were almost 30 years ago. Um, you know, we don't handwrite reports anymore. Everything's on a computer. 
I was issued a Polaroid camera back in 1993 to help with domestic violence investigations. Uh, I'd be surprised if anybody out here, uh, uh, part of the panel or part of the webinar even has a Polaroid camera anymore. <laughs> so uh, we have to understand as, as leadership in law enforcement that, that times change, we have to progress and uh, continually review policies and procedures and be willing to have, uh, uh, have those difficult conversations of, of change. Mayor Paul, have we had to, um, what leadership changes have we had to make in, in reference to the headlines? Well, you know, it's not so much leadership as we have looking at our policies. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of us, you know, serve four year terms and, and then the staff and, and so on. We're, we're continually hiring. We always look at trying to build a diverse uh, workforce, not to meet any kind of quotas or numbers, but because that's, uh, they're, they're talented people of all types out there. And we want to go get the best and brightest out there. And if you're going to get the best and brightest, you can't just look at one narrow category of people. You've got to look at everybody. Uh, so we put a real emphasis on that, uh, of recruiting and bringing in people of different backgrounds and different, uh, uh ethnic, uh, uh, backgrounds. To, to make sure we have that diversity uh, as part of our uh, decision-making. But as I said, it's not just about being diverse, it's about being inclusive. How do you integrate them into the decision-making process? Uh, and uh, so it's, um, it's an, as Keith said, it's an ongoing issue. You, you, continually, you, you continually have to evaluate your own mind, you have your own mindset. What are you doing to stay on top of things? But we're also doing some things that, to try and keep us on the cutting edge of all aspects of, uh, of city operations. We recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Kennesaw State University. We're their urban laboratory. Uh, and so when we have issues like this, uh, you know, we, we, we want to, I talked to the president of uh, KSU this week, uh, twice, in fact, to talk about how we, 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 uh, implement this and you know when you talk about social services they've got a great nursing school they've got a great so social services curriculum and faculty we want to be able to tap that we want to be able to bring those thought leaders into our city i was talking with a guy yesterday about uh, from an engineering point of view some things that are going on and i said i want to have a brown once we get out of the covid thing i want to have a brown bag lunch with our public works department so that they can see these new innovations that are going on out there we want to do the same thing with the, with the health public health and the social services uh, uh, faculty at KSU we want to be able to understand what are the what, what's on the cutting edge what are what are the real people who are leading doing mm -hmm. and we want to be we don't want to be trailing we want to be the the cutting edge of that and we want to bring these thought leaders in particularly the academics to talk to our people about what's going on, what are the trends, what are the new things that are going on out there to help us do a better job in all of these areas, but particularly taking advantage of, of the, the current uh, thinking on the university campus about uh, inclusion, diversity, uh, and these are some of the things that we're talking with KSU to help us with. Uh, it, as I say, it's an ongoing issue. You don't, there's, I, one of the things I've learned, there's not a milestone. And then you can say your job's done. Right. This is an ongoing process, an ongoing conversation. It's about getting better every day and then bringing the resources to the table to ensure that you're getting better every day. And that's one of the reasons why the, the memorandum of understanding with KSU was such an important thing to me uh, is it gives us access to resources that other cities aren't taking advantage of so that we can continue to stay focused on these kinds of issues and get better at them. That's good. Yeah, you did. You brought up uh, COVID. How has the um, COVID impacted the crimes here in Sandy Springs? Have you seen a reduction or increase? So early on it, with, with, the, uh, with, with the pandemic, uh, obviously more people are staying home, more right. people are working from home. And uh, for, fortunately for those of us that, that have had to come to work uh, every day during the pandemic, traffic has been much lighter now. It's 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 gotten much much more uh, crowded out on the roads here lately. I would say in the past uh, three to six weeks. But with regards to crime, uh, 
unfortunately, our, our property crimes have gone down this year. Um, I, I would attribute a lot of that to the fact that more people are home. So the opportunity for burglaries and, and things of that nature really aren't there as much. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen an uptick in some violent crime, uh, especially in the last uh, six months or so. Uh, some of those uh, are robberies and assaults. Uh, and some of those are, are domestic related, associated with people maybe spending a little too much time together in their homes. But uh, overall, the, uh, that the crime rate has dropped as a result of the pandemic. And, and like I said, people, people being home, people not out as much, uh, right. not as much uh, opportunity for crime for the, uh, for, for the criminals to take advantage of. Now, I know we are um, approaching Christmas, the holiday season, so people may be out a little bit more. And then over in our neighboring communities, we've seen shootings at Lenox Mall. Um, and how can we, I guess we can't necessarily prevent it, but if it was to come to perimeter or to the Sandy Springs, um, possibly looting, how would that be handled by the department? Uh, well, the same way that we would handle things uh, uh, at, at any other time. Uh, we, we are very well staffed. So we are, uh, we're, we're not facing a staffing shortage and uh, we're, we're very, very proud of the work that our officers are doing in uh, being proactive out here. Uh, one of the things that, uh, when everything that was going on this summer, one of, the, one of the things that we told our officers to do is keep doing your job, mm -hmm. don't stop. And so you'll see our officers out. We, we are patrolling the uh, shopping centers. We're out riding the bikes through Whole Foods. You know, we're, we're still out doing the proactive police work that uh, that we're expected to do. And I think that helps. Because another trend that's coming up is drag racing. Um, have we seen an increase of that here in Sandy Springs? And if so, how is that handled? We, we are we, we are seeing a little bit more of that. Um, and it's it's frankly a, a problem that's going on across the metro Atlanta area. Uh, the, the news is focused mostly on the issues that are going on downtown. But we've had issues from Gwinnett and DeKalb County, all the way over across to Cobb and, and West Cobb County with uh, street racers and illegal drag racing. Um, not to get into too many specifics on how we're, uh, how we're managing to find some of these people, uh, but we have a, a very robust intelligence unit here at Sandy Springs Police Department. And we share information with intelligence officers from other agencies. And so, like I said, without getting into too many details, um, we are sharing information with other agencies. And in many cases, we're able to get out ahead of the street racers. And in many instances, when we show up, when two or three police cars show up and these folks are starting to congregate around to, to start their drag racing, they'll leave. They'll, they'll go somewhere else where they're not uh, not going to risk either getting a ticket, getting their car impounded, or going to jail. Well, I definitely think this has been a start to a healthy dialogue and conversation for the Sandy Springs uh, community. Uh, Mayor Paul, would you like to leave any words of uh, encouragement to let us know that this is the best community? <laughs> well, I tell everybody that we want Sandy Springs to be the most envied community uh, in, in, in the Southeast, not envied from a seven deadly sins point of view, but envied from the perspective that we want people to point to Sandy Springs and say, if you want to know how it's done and done right, go to Sandy Springs. And we try that. It's a, it's an ongoing process. It's always a moving target, but the motivations to, to be better in all these areas are shared by the leadership of the city, the elected leadership, the city manager and, and, and the upper staff. And, and I have been unbelievably impressed by the leadership of the police department in their leadership role in some of these areas. Some people, but police officers are not all, you know, in, in a lot of areas, not known for being innovative or, or forward thinking. Uh, they just get out and do their job. The leadership for the Sandy Springs Police Department, I am, you know, on a regular basis, I'm, I'm informed about 
interesting and exciting new initiatives that they've taken on their own with no push from the city elected leadership. It's, it, and that's a reflection of Keith and Ken and the, and the leadership team of the police department uh, and, and making sure that they are always getting, that, that, that getting better is a daily initiative. It's a daily imperative uh, you, and you never arrive. So w the whole city is, is focused on that. The, the city council, the city manager, the police department, and we're, we're, we're focused on trying to do the right things for the right reasons. And as I tell people, if you do the right things for the right reasons, you're always going to be doing the things you need to be doing. And that's what, that's my, that's my instruction to everybody. Just go out and do the right things for the right reasons and we'll all be okay. Deputy Chief. Well, you know, I, I just want to leave the public with this is that we started our police department in 2006 with the goal of being the best. And we, we created the department using best practices at the time. And we've never strayed away from that. It's always about, you know, what's the best way that we can get the best results that we can and, and engage the community in the best way that we can. And as the mayor said, we're, we're always striving to do better. We're always striving to do our best. And we're, we're continuously looking at policies and procedures. As a matter of fact, next week, we have, uh, we have individuals coming in from the state certification board to review all of our policies and procedures that, that we do on a, uh, every three years. And they'll be here next week to review those to make sure that everything is current and up to date and that we're, we're still utilizing all the best practices out there. So, um, you know, if, if we always wanna do our best and always wanna strive to do better. Well, again, thank you for your time and your insight for um, addressing the concerns of the citizens here um, in Sandy Springs. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jan and let us close us out. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Marissa. All righty, thank you so much to Keith Zugans, Rusty Paul and to Clarissa Sparks for um, your insights and for your candid conversation. We truly appreciate it. Um, Clarissa, I'm gonna pick up on one thing that you said. You asked about leadership changes in the police department and at the city. I'm gonna do a shameless plug here, plug here that if you um, have not been through leadership, Sandy Springs, or would like more information, um, we have police officers and firefighters in every class. Um, we pride ourselves on integrating our community. We have city employees that are in every class. So I urge you, get to know your community, get involved. Easiest way to get involved is to join an organization, become a volunteer, and Leadership Sandy Springs is all about trying to help you do that. So um, if you're interested, again, leadershipsandysprings.org, and I can't thank you enough. It's been a wonderful program today. I've seen a lot of compliments in the chat room, so we appreciate that, and thank you very much for joining us today. Take care, everybody. Be safe, and happy holidays. Thank One you. last question before we go. Uh, Deputy Chief, who has the best donuts in Sandy Springs? Oh, oh you, you know. Low blow. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to say that I, I have eaten my fair share of donuts over the years. Um, I'm, I'm always partial to Dunkin', though. Partial to Dunkin'. Okay, thank you again. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Bye.